So in this uh, workshop, the main topic will be uh, basically control theory and an introduction to it so um, you guys can understand how the two and the quadrant will be using uh, later on so you guys will actually be tuning, tuning them yourselves in this workshop uh, after this. So I'll start off by talking uh, by giving you guys a very basic introduction to control theory and kind of uh, so you guys get an intuitive understanding on what control theory is and kind of what the difference between just regular kind of firmware is and what actual controls is. Because there's a, there's a, it, I think it often gets mixed up because it's often associated with, to be the same thing, uh, but it's actually quite different. Um, so I'll be talking about just a basic RC car example uh, to kind of simplify things and get you guys um, in the head headspace to uh, think about how you just implement a simple RC car. Uh, we'll be talking about PID controls. Uh, has anyone heard of PID before? Yeah. yeah, so it's a very popular control scheme. And basically, if you guys are into aviation, if you guys are into aer aer aerial robotics, or any autonomous vehicle, PID control, like you'll always hear about, uh, about it. So we'll be talking about what it actually is, and we'll, we'll break it down on the steps on like how, how you would actually implement it in code if you wanted to. Uh, then we'll talk about what's actually used in aircraft, kind of the differences between uh, planes and quadcopters, um, and what other control methods there are. So there's like a lot of courses that you can take in controls if you're, if you're an engineer. Um, and I'll be, so there's a lot, a lot to this field. Uh, this will just kind of be a very basic um, introduction about <clears throat> enough but to know what we use um, in aerial robotics, at least. Um, then we'll be talking about the actual tuning method, some um, strategies that you can use to get the right gains, uh, so that you have you can have a stable flying system. Um, and then we'll be um, talking about how to use actual mission planner or the ground station software to uh, actually tune uh, these gains for the different settings in your aircraft, so that you can understand what all the uh, text boxes and dialogues are. Why does this keep? I do this. Sorry. I'll be real careful not to help it. Oh. Where's the mouse? Okay, if I do that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So yeah. So let's get started with a with a problem scenario. Say you've got an RC car and you've got some controller on it that's able to control the actual motors on. It. You can control the actual speed of the car and you can control its steering angle. Those are the two things you can control, and those are the two, thing you, two things you have. You have no other sensors on it. So the task is to drive a car exactly 90 degrees to the right. So I'm going a certain direction, and I want to go 90 degrees to the right. How would you approach this? Does anyone have any clues? Like, no wrong answers here. You have no? All you can do is control the motors. Imagine this is like a course. Or something that you're taking. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that would achieve a turn. Um, the actual mechanics of it, say you, you have the mechanics of the turn figured out, like you can steer easily. The question is, I want to, I'm, I'm heading this way, I want to go 90 degrees to the right after I'm finished the maneuver. Not 87 degrees, not 45 degrees, I want to go exactly 90 degrees to the right. Or, Kind of like that's the objective. You don't want to just turn, you want to turn roughly 90 degrees. Yeah. 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 Say you were doing this for a course, you have like two hours to implement it. What's the easiest thing that you can think of doing? Okay. So, So, let's see if you do tank. tank drive, yeah, you could probably, so as you mentioned, one of the different combinations is trial and error, right? Now, as engineers, that may not be something that we're proud of thinking of, but that is a, a valid method of doing it. So you pick a particular speed for your car, and then you do a slight turn, say like a 10 degree steering turn. And then you kind of time how long it takes for that 10 degree steering turn and that speed. 
uh, how long it would take you to do it exactly uh, a 90 degree turn. So you would actually have to physically test the system and like kind of by trial and error, error determine the parameters for you to get that turn working. So that's a perfectly fine method of doing things. Uh, it's also called hard coding. Um, and you, you, you will probably do this in your engineering careers at some point in time, um, especially if you're in mechatronics. But basically the advantage of this is that it's simple, right? Like conceptually there's not much to it. Um, if, you had, if you had to do it to like a couple hours and you have to present something, um, then you can do it pretty easily. I've done it myself. So the disadvantage though is that you've locked yourself to a particular speed and steering combination, right? If I go any faster, if I go any slower, uh, if my steering, if I want to do a sharper turn, I can't really do that. I've hard coded it to a particular speed, at a particular steering angle. You could have multiple maneuvers on file if you want to say do a faster or slow turn, uh, but then that starts to get more and more complicated as you're doing things. And there are better things, ways of doing things. So then, other method that you mentioned is uh, let's do some calculations, right? Um, so that is, so say you know how fast the motors spin or how fast the motors move given a particular signal. Um, so you know, you kind of know the relationship between your motor speed and signal curve, right? So you know if I give it four volts, it's gonna go 300 RPM or something like that, right? I know the radius of the wheels that I'm using, so now I can relate the uh, motor speed, or the RPM, to a linear distance. Uh, and from that, I can actually convert my, the signal that I have to uh, a speed, right? So if I have going four volts, I know that my system will be going uh, like 10 meters a second, right? So now I've done a little bit of calculations and I've actually mapped speeds, um, or I've, I've, mapped, I've mapped signals to actual physical speeds. And I can do the same thing with the steering angle and servo positions. So uh, servos are like motors, by the way. Um, they're just, uh, you, give it a, you give them an input and they actually rotate to a specific angle for you. They don't have to do anything. Special, but essentially they're, they're motors uh, and how they're assembled. But yeah, I can do the exact same thing with uh, determining the steering angle and the servo. So if I give my servo um, a particular PWM pulse signal, then I know it'll rotate to 20 degrees, right? So now I, through some simple calculations, I've uh, been able to map uh, signals to physical uh, speeds and angles. And then based on that, I can perform some kind of math, right? I can do some kind of math, some kind of maybe integration, um, basically uh, to, uh, make, to have my curve go so that I turn exactly 90 degrees to the right, okay? Based on what I have. Um, I'm not actually gonna show the math here. I'm not sure how complicated it is, but you can do this beforehand or you can do it in real time if you'd like to. And basically, this is a more complicated, but it does give you the capability of actually modifying parameters of your turn, right? So you, now you can uh, increase your speed, you can increase your steering angle, you can recalculate the parameters that you have because now you can, you've can you modeled your system, right? So you've modeled uh, the relationship between the signals that you give to your system and its physical outputs. And because of that, now you can, you have more flexibility in what you're capable of doing. So now you can do more complex maneuvers like you can maybe do even a 45 degree turn based on the model. So this works well as well. This is perfectly fine. And the advantage is that, as I've mentioned, you can do uh, different steering operations, for example, a variety of speeds, and you're not hard coding to a specific speed or a specific uh, rate of turn. The disadvantage, so let's start thinking, what if there's a bump along the path? What do you guys think would happen? Yeah, it'll throw something off. You're probably not gonna end up at that 90 degree turn when you finish. You're probably you might end up somewhere else. What if the wheels slip, right? Because based on your model, you're assuming that there's no wheel slippage. So a particular signal gets you a particular physical speed, right? Which means you're, you're, you're expecting to go a particular displacement all the time. Um, and what, if, what happens if you're on, on an incline, right? Because if you're on an, on an incline, you might actually have to travel more to do a perfectly 90 degree uh, turn if you're looking at it from the top. So now you have all these different conditions um, that basically throw off your entire. So what we designed previously was actually a control system. Um, and these conditions basically break our control system. They no longer allow us to control the system the way that we want it to. 
Um, and as I mentioned, they, they all work. Uh, the problem is robustness and reliability, right? As I mentioned, given different conditions, your system might not perform, perform the way that you want it to. Um, and what we just described, the previous two proposals, having hard coding and having some done some calculations, uh, that's called open loop control. So in control theory, this is a pretty common term. It's called open loop because we don't have any sensors on our system that actually lets us control this any better, right? If we don't have any sensors, the best that we can do is to try to develop uh, some kind of model, mathematical model for our system, and control it through some mathematical calculations as we had before on the second case. Um, so the problem is that we can't really compensate for any differences in, in what's happening uh, in the current path, for example. So uh, we don't actually know what the current state of the vehicle is uh, at any one point in time. Uh, and the state of the vehicle would be like the current heading of our car. If we don't know what that is, um, we're not using it. So this would be open loop control. Now, let's give you guys a second scenario. Let's update the scenario. Now let's say we have some kind of compass on our car. So this is like a sensor. Um, and this can measure the heading of the vehicle. And a heading is like the direction relative to uh, the true north or something. Right? So just like a regular compass. Now, how would you implement a controller, given this new sensor, uh, to turn the car exactly 90 degrees and maintain the heading as it drives, as in the previous case? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the gist of it. So, you take an initial heading, you take uh, the heading that you want to get to, which would be like, your initial heading plus 90 degrees, for example, right? Um, and then you basically, if you're to the left of it, then you would go right. If you're to the right of it, you would go left, right? Um, and you can do that by a constant amount, right? Say um, every time you're to the right of it, you turn your wheels 10 degrees to the right, or if, if you're to the left of your desired heading, you would turn your wheels 10 degrees to the right. Every time you're uh, to the left of your desired heading, you would turn your wheels 10 degrees to the left, right? So you're kind of tracking the actual heading. You're starting to track the heading given your actual sensors on the system. So, yeah, as if it doesn't match, turn by a constant amount based on where we are. Uh, so does anyone see any problems so far with this control? <laughs> right, so that's a good point. So that's, that's the issue. So if you're turning by a constant amount, no matter how far away from the desired trajectory you are, what's going to happen is that your car is going to start traveling, and it's just going to start oscillating around the point that you actually want to get to. Does anyone have, does anyone have a physical intuition as to why that would happen? Because even if I'm like one millimeter or one degree off uh, from the heading that I want to get to, I'm going to steer a fairly significant amount by 10 degrees just to try to correct for that. And based on the response time, the response time of the system, by the time that I actually turn 10 degrees, I might be like another one degree off from the other direction or so forth. And it might actually increase and oscillate and like I might actually be diverging from the path as I go on. Um, and this is a case of, uh, so this is the case of Depending on how you've tuned your system and depending on the characteristics, you might get small oscillations and you, or you might get diverging oscillations as you keep on trying to follow the path, right? Um, so if I said, for example, uh, if I aggressively said I want to turn 45 degrees uh, on my steering angle every time I'm slightly off, then you can kind of see that the car might really like go all the way, like go all over the place and trying to track the heading that I want to get to because of just how much it's serious. Uh, for the tiniest amount of error, right? Um, and you can you can try to fix that by say say you only move one degree uh, is the constant turn radius that you uh, uh, use any time that you're off uh, from the heading. That's fine, but then what's going to happen is that it's going to be like a 500 meter, meter wide radius just for you to try to do a 90 degree turn, right? The actual performance of your system suffers. Uh, based on because of this. And you're still going to get oscillations in the end, right? So, uh, yeah, so this solution is more robust though, right? Because now we have a sensor on our system. So if we have like any bumps along the way, 
we have we need new wheel slippage. We don't care. We can correct for it, right? Our system doesn't care. If, as long as our heading matches, it doesn't matter what, what kind of obstacle we're facing. So the previous conditions that I mentioned about the incline, that would all be resolved. We would still end up at a 90 degree angle, um, assuming that we've, we've set up, up like a kind of good uh, constant turn radius now. Um, and as I mentioned, you're, you'll never be able to settle uh, in any direction after the turn. You'll just kind of be going like a worm. Um, or you might just completely diverge and explode and go all over the place. Um, and yeah, that's mainly because just having a constant amount of turn no matter how far away from the heading we really are. So, do you guys have any intuition on how we can kind of resolve this? Yeah. You can set a tolerance, yeah. Like, if you're this little amount away from the heading, Yeah, so you can have like a, say you're five degrees away from the heading, you can just be like, okay, turn off all steering control. Right? So uh, that would solve the issue of having too many oscillations. But if you say you're like going into a path and you're going, uh, you're within your tolerance threshold. At some point, you're going to leave that tolerance threshold, and you're going to make your controller again go back into the tolerance threshold. So you're still going to oscillate. The problem still exists in that scenario, right? Um, it does. It would fix it. It might. It might help you uh, stabilize your system. Um, but you're still going to have the same issue of having constant oscillations. Um, so that's a that's a good guess. Though. Does anyone have anything else? Any other ideas? Yep. Yep. That's exactly it. So, say we're like we're traveling north. We want to go west, right? We probably want to turn quite a bit uh, in order to get to west. Now, say we're traveling north and we want to go northwest, right? Or like a little bit less. We probably don't want to steer as much because we don't need to steer as much because the actual the difference between our headings is less. Uh, the difference between the desired and our trajectory heading is less. So something that we can do maybe is why don't we do it based on that, right? So proportionally regulate the steering based on how far we are away from our desired heading, right? Um, so if we're like 180 degrees, say, say we want to go completely backwards, we want to steer really hard. If we're like one or two degrees off, we don't want to steer that hard. We want to steer a little bit. And that's kind of the intuition behind what proportional control is, right? So you have some kind of error value. So you take what our current heading is, you subtract it from where we want to go, the desired heading. And that's called, we're going to call that the error. And that's a very common term used in controls. We're going to calculate the steering angle that we actually want to go to, and that's going to be equal to the error multiplied by some constant, right? So say the error is, say I'm going north, I want to go west, the error would be like 90 degrees, right? Um, and say I have a constant of 0 0.5, so I would turn my wheels 45 degrees to the direction um, that I want to go to in that case. Um, say the error is only 1 degree then I'm only going to turn my wheels 0.5 degrees to try to get to the heading that I want to get, right? So intuitively, um, this should work. This is called proportional control or P-control. Um, and it's very commonly used in a lot of different applications. Um, you'll see this basically everywhere. It's one of the simplest control schemes that you can implement. Um, and it's a form of closed loop control. So previously we talked about open loop control. Open loop means that you have no sensor feedback. You're just relying on your mathematical model of your system uh, to try and control it. Closed loop means we're actually using our sensor feedback in some useful way, right? The previous methods uh, about just doing a constant turn radius, that's also a closed loop control. Cool, and this is like block diagram. This is, this is what a block diagram is. Um, you'll see them everywhere in control theory in general. Um, they kind of look a little bit complicated, but they're simpler than you would think. So you have some kind of value for a desired heading. That's the input that you give to your car or your system or your plane or your quad. This goes um, in and say you have the desired heading. Say we haven't measured a heading yet. Um, this goes in and you, you're multi going to multiply it by some constant value. Oh, sorry. You do have a measured heading. So the subtraction sign means that 
you're subtracting the desired heading from your measured heading, and you're getting the heading error as kind of the formula that you saw before. You're multiplying that by the constant value, and you're feeding that into your motors. The, what you're feeding in may be like a voltage or something, or it could be like a signal pulse. Then you're outputting based on, say, these motors control the steering. Uh, these would output a particular steering angle to your actual system, and then you would measure a new heading. This heading gets, this new heading uh, gets fed back in, and you kind of repeat the loop, right? So this is, um, you can kind of see how you would implement this via software as well, how you would have like maybe a while loop or something. Um, and you would just constantly go through this loop. Um, every time you get a new reading, you would recalculate the error, you would multiply, you would give the motors a new input, and you keep on, you keep on doing that until um, forever, basically. Right? So the constant that I was talking about, uh, what we multiply the error by, or the difference between our, the trajective, trajective error, or trajective heading and desired heading, that's called a gain. Um, and specifically, because we're doing only uh, proportional control, this is called the P gain. The higher the gain is, the faster your system responds to an error. So if I said, so in my previous example, say I had a nine, I want to go north, uh, I'm, I'm going north, I want to go west, my difference is 90 degrees. If my proportional gain was 0 0.5, I'd make my steering go 45 degrees in response to that, in response to that error. If my proportional gain was 1, I'd make my steering go 90 degrees in response to that error, right? So you can kind of see intuitively that the higher the gain, the faster that the system will respond to, uh, to an error. So the sharper the turn, uh, so the higher the gain, the sharper the turn the system will take in order to meet its heading uh, objective. So I've got a question here. Why don't we just set a super high gain? Like that way our system will basically go to our desired heading instantaneously, right? Does anyone see any potential problems with this? No, there's no rule on where, how much, uh, how large the gain should be. It could be like 5,000. It really depends on your system, right? Um, that's a good point uh, about the oscillations. So that is part of it, yeah. Um, so let's talk about the oscillations bit. So first of all, what happens when I, set, when I set a gain that's too high? So the motors have limits, right? They're physical devices. Um, when I control a system, I'm going to give it some kind of voltage. That voltage will get converted to a speed. Um, if I set like a very high gain, then you can kind of see that it would set a higher and higher voltage that I would be feeding back into the motors, right? If we take a look at the block diagram again, right? Um, the output of this, which is all of this, this is my controller, right? This constant value block. Um, the higher this is, the higher the voltage that gets fed in to the motors, for example, or the servos, or whatever else, right? Um, and they can you can't give motors infinity volts and expect them to perform uh, the same way, right? Um, all physical devices saturate at some point, um, and as you mentioned about the oscillations, you might also get instability. So this is a particular issue with control systems. So gains that are too fast may cause the system to go unstable. Um, you might see this when tuning the quads later in the workshop. If you, we might try it. Uh, we're doing it today. We're doing it? OK, you guys will see it. Um, and what instability means. Instability basically means I tell the car to go to a 45 degree angle, and it just like turns. It does like 360 degree turns all the time. Right? It's completely diverging from where I want it to go, and it keeps on diverging exponentially. Um, from where it should be going. Um, or it can oscillate around the heading uncontrollably, right? So it can keep on oscillating around where you want to be, and it will never stop. Ever. So that's also um, a form of instability. So say, okay, so P control works. It works pretty well. Uh, you've done it, you've tested it, the car tracks well, and you get some small oscillations after the turn completes, right? Uh, and then you have some dudes like in your way, and he just kicks your car. Um, and as he kicks your car, you notice that the car diverges from its path, and it takes kind of a while for you to uh, uh, to recover back to its original heading. So how can you counteract these instantaneous disturbances? Is what the question is, right? 
Um, how can you stop, or how can you recover from uh, this dude's kicks faster, basically, right? How can you recover from instantaneous disturbances? Um, anyone have any clues? This one is a little bit tricky. So I'm gonna, I totally wouldn't have guessed it either, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, so one thing that you can do is you can increase your proportional gain, right? So that your system responds faster to the disturbance. That's a totally valid thing to do, right? Um, as we mentioned, the system responds faster based on the gain. If I set it higher, if the dude kicks my car, I'll respond faster and I'll keep on going straight faster. Um, the issue is that you can only increase it so much until you become unstable, right? Um, and also, like, say you want to be able to do smooth turns. Like, I don't want to say I'm controlling an actual car. And say every time I wanted to turn right, the passengers in my car were just like, feel like they're in a roller coaster because I set a high peak gain just so that I can um, counteract this, these instant disturbances. So the question is, can we make it so that we're able to perform smooth turns on a regular basis, but counteract only instant disturbances? And only instant disturbances. Uh, maybe we can have some kind of different gain that we can that allows us to control that. Okay. Um, sorry. Set up the gain as an exponential. So have a changing gain. So in controls, usually you don't have a changing gain as you keep going. Usually that's uh, constant because that's like a very easy way. I'm assuming there there is, there is such a thing as uh, gain scheduling. So say you're like in a different state of your system, say like you've got a recall and it's in plane mode or like it's in quad copper mode, depending on like the mode you can switch gains, but usually you don't have like um, constant running functions to like what your gain should be. That usually leads to, that would probably lead to instability at some point. Yeah. And it's pretty hard to control. And they're very well tuned. Yeah, you would have a very well tuned function, you would have to test it a lot, but that is a good guess, right? So having some kind of a variable gain um, that maybe reads in, I don't know, some sensor value, and based on that sensor value, it adjusts the gain to be faster or slower. So say like you have an accelerometer, the accelerometer is like, yo, I've just, I've just been kicked, let me increase my gain, and then adjust for it, right? That could be something. There is an easier way, though. Yeah, so D control. So let's introduce a new term to the system, okay? This term will act on the derivative of the heading error, or the heading rate, right? So this is similar to proportional control, but it's called der derivative control. It sounds pretty fancy, um, it's really not. So it allows us to compensate for instant disturbances without affecting regular um, turning performance as much. So what I mean is, say you just want to do a 90 degree turn, you'll be able to do that fairly smoothly um, uh, but if some guy kicks your car, you'll be able to respond to that faster than you would when doing a smooth turn. Um, you can use the numerical der 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 derivation. I misspelled that over there. Um, it's simpler than it sounds. If you guys took grade 12 courses, you know how to do symbolic derivation with a dh slash dt or whatever. But basically, the premise is you have some kind of deriv derivative error. So that is going to be equal to the current heading error subtracted from the previous heading error, right? And that's going to give you the error rate, essentially, how fast you're diverging from your path, right? Previously, we had we have how much we diverge from the path. This is how fast we're diverging from the path. And remember, we calculated the error in our P case, uh, which was equal to the current heading minus the desired heading, right? So you keep track of the error um, over current iterations. So you can get uh, the, the just the error rate or the derivative, derivative error, which is just the difference between your current and previous errors. So then what we can do is we can super, super, superimpose, which is a fancy word in control, basically means add on um, to the output from our pr proportional and derivative controller uh, to make a PD control. So PD controller. Uh, so say we have total output. So we calculate the error rate, which is that, as from the previous slide, is the current error minus the last error. The output from my derivative controller, my D controller, would be some derivative gain, as we mentioned previously, multiplied by the error rate, which is what we have before. The proportional output is the same as in the P case. We, we don't touch that, right? 
So we have some kind of proportional, uh, a proportional output, which would be um, the error multiplied by the difference between the current and the uh, desired trajectory, um, multiplied by our proportional gain. Oh, this doesn't make sense. Okay, sorry. This should be uh, just a regular error. Um, and then we combine the total output, which is what we actually feed back to our motors. Um, the combination of what the proportional, proportional controller uh, gives us and the deriv derivative controller gives us. So basically, the motor is not controlled by two things. It's controlled by the actual difference between your trajectories, and it's also controlled by the weight uh, of differences between your tra trajectories. Okay. Allow, adding derivative control also allows us to kill the oscillations um, that the system may have a lot quicker. So when you have peak control, you do have oscillations. Uh, when, you have, when you're adding uh, a derivative controller to it, you, you, you're able to kill those oscillations faster. So you can get better performance of your system, right? You can get a nicer turn going with your car. Um, and on top of that, it's also useful for compensating for instant disturbances, right? So if your car hits a bump and it like misaligns, or if some dude kicks your car and it misaligns, it can respond to those events a lot faster and correct for itself a lot faster. Um, and this will not affect the PE controller, right? So you're still going to get similar performance to just when you just had uh, your PE control, um, but you're you're also going to get these uh, benefits. Um, and just for um, intuition, you can think of G-control as rate control. Um, if the system has a constant error, so say you're constantly going 45 degrees, this controller will do absolutely nothing. The only thing that will actually affect, um, so if you, you can't only have G-control, right? If I only had, if I was only using the derivative of my error, um, and I was, going, uh, I was going north and I want to go west, as my car is traveling, the actual difference in error doesn't change. So this controller won't actually affect my system. The only time it affects my system is if there's a change in the error. Right? So you can't necessarily only have D control in your system and have it be controlled. You can have only P control, you can have PG control, but you can't only have D control. Like you can, but it's not going to do anything. Um, because the derivative of the error will be zero, right? And the derivative uh, and the decontroller acts on the derivative of the error. So let's add on to the previous block diagram, right? So this is what we had all before. I just renamed the constant value to a P gain because that's what it actually is. Um, and then I added this block with, with a D gain, right? So we measure some kind of heading from our sensors. We feed it back into the system. We know where we want to go. We subtract the two, and that gives us the heading error. We multiply it by our proportional gain, and we put it into the motors, uh, into the motor input. On top of that, we also take the error and we calculate the heading error rate based on the value of heading error that we stored previously. We multiply that by our derivative gain, and we feed, and then we also add that onto the motor input. Right. So the motor input is a combination of the output of these two controllers. Um, the motor does its thing, it moves, it steers, steers the vehicle, and then we get a new measured heading, and we go back and we repeat. Okay. Does anyone have any questions so far about the controllers? So when, when the P control makes it turn, doesn't it change the error rate? Yes, it does. Yeah, they do interact. They're not completely independent systems. So I can't, for example, like figure out the best value for my proportional controller and just have a derivative controller and be like, it's, it's all smooth sailing from here now. They do couple with each other and they do interact with each other. And um, I will mention a drawback of adding a D controller in the next slide. Um, but yeah, they do couple with each other. And then, yeah, obviously the D controller also affects how fast, how, how far away you are from the, uh, your, your actual error difference, which will also affect the D controller, right? So they, directly interact with each other as they uh, move. So, sorry, I guess I didn't mention the drawbacks. So D-Control, you can add it, but it does, it can cause instability. So you can have a well-tuned D-Controller type system, and then as soon as you add your D-Controller, you're like totally destabilized, totally diverges. That's because there is a coupling between 
that coupling can sometimes cause benefits, but it can sometimes cause instability as well. They can interact in such a way where they actually adversely affect each other, and then you might have had a perfectly stable system with just having a V controller. You add a D controller on, and it just destabilizes entirely. And we might be also showing you guys that as well. Um, any more questions about D control so far? Okay, so let's think about like the last problem scenario. So your car is tracking well. You implement the PD control. Um, it's like built, it's it, it's making some pretty nice smooth turns. It's got pretty nice disturbance rejections. It doesn't have a lot of oscillations when it finally finishes the turn. But you're like you notice that there's some kind of constant offset, right? Before it, almost as if you had some kind of a tolerance threshold um, in your controller, but you didn't actually implement. So it's always like off one degree from like being perfect. And when it's off from one degree, it just stops responding. And then it just diverges again until it has to correct. So there's still um, some oscillations. But in general, we call this uh, uh, steady state error. Right? Um, so in the case of heading, um, it'll be like a degree off all the time. right? Um, in the case of, say you had like some kind of um, line following robot, it might be like totally offset from the center of the line or something. Um, and it might stabilize at that point. Um, so how can we fix this so that our car tracks closer to the trajectory heading with zero steady state error? So I can't um, demonstrate, I don't think we can demonstrate this in the quads, but this might be a thing, say you're flying a plane um, and you've got a couple of waypoints uh, set up uh, that you want to fly the plane in between. And there's a constant wind that's being blown in the direction of the side of the plane. Uh, so the plane is constantly flying kind of a meter away from where it should be, but it's flying straight and it's flying stable. So that's kind of the scenario that I'm trying to describe here. So how can we, so that's called steady state error, and how can we fix it so that our car tracks closer to the trajected heading with like essentially no steady state error? So one solution would be to increase the KP gain so that the respond so that the motor responds to even smaller errors. So in order to understand kind of why the problem might occur, say you have a one degree difference uh, in your uh, heading. The one degree uh, from your controller might be uh, converted to like 0.5 volts on your motor. Your motor needs at least like one volt in order for it to even start turning, right? So you have an error, your controller is outputting some kind of value, but that value is just not enough to make your system respond, right? Because your, your motor needs at least one volt, you're giving it 0 0.5 volts, but your error is only like, so you, you basically your error is too small for your system to react. So something that we can do is we can increase KP, right? So we can increase the gain, proportional gain of our system, so that 0, that 0 0.5 volts turns into at least one volt. But then we get all the previous issues of having high KP. Um, so, we're looking to increase, uh, decrease steady state error, um, and as I mentioned, it has the previous problems. Um, so, we implemented last time a derivative controller. Maybe we can go backwards and maybe do something with integration. Um, so, I controllers. Um, so, these are, these take an integral sum of the error and superimposed it with the total output like we had in the previous case uh, by multiplying with it with an integral gain. So we have our error that we calculated for our P-controller, and we have this new term called the total error, and we just add this on uh, to the total error, right? So we're basically summing all the errors that we keep getting from our system. Um, this, this error could also be negative, right? Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be positive, so the total error term could be positive or negative. Then we have this integral output that's simply equal to the total error multiplied by the gain. And then we superimpose that with the previous controller outputs. So we just add that on. Taking a look at a block diagram. Oh. Yeah, let's talk about this. So this is called combining um, an I. This is called PID control. So you, you, PID control is essentially made up of three separate controllers. A proportional controller, a derivative controller, and I controller. Um, to 
get the intuition behind how an ID controller kind of tracks. Say you're con you have a constant um, error, right? So say you have a constant uh, one degree offset. Your V controller generates 0 0.5 volts, but your I the total error keeps on summing up as your robot keeps on moving, right? So the one degree gets summed up. It turns into two degrees in the next iteration of your controller. Three degrees into the next iteration. Four degrees into the next one, right? Finally, until it reaches five degrees, and then based on or ten, de ten degrees, or five degrees, or, and then once it gets multiplied by your uh, integral gain, that gets added on to your uh, output, and say another 0.5 volts is added, right? So you're finally feeding in one volt to your motors. So the intuition is that you're adding constant error amounts until they add up enough to affect your controller and try to stabilize or have your system track with zero steady state error. So, in terms of PID controllers, if we have a full, uh, we can also have just a PI controller. We don't actually need a derivative controller, uh, depending on our system. But if we tune all our gains correctly, finally this should result in a fairly robust and stable system that can track with no error uh, and respond to any disturbances and turn smoothly. Um, this is more complicated than in the hard coding case, for example, or just in the proportional game, uh, pro pro proportional case. But it's usually well worth the effort if you uh, actually tune these systems correctly. And this is the block diagram, right? So we kind of had the the D term and the P term um, from last from last time. We just added on this new term called the for the integral controller. So we basically take the integral of the error of the summation or the summation of the error. Um, feed it back and then add it into the motor output and that gets fed back into the system again. Okay. Does anyone have questions about eye controllers? They're a little more abstract, I guess, because they can't easily visualize how they work. Yeah. One uh sorry. One always That's a good question. So that would be true, but you have to think about the error, right? So say you're oscillating, right? Your error might be positive, and then say you reach the other side, your error might start getting negative, right? Um, so the actual error term doesn't necessarily have to be positive. This could be positive or negative, just depending on which orientation you are, right? And then I'm just adding it on. I'm not strictly, I'm not converting this to a positive value before I add it on to my total error. I'm just adding, adding it on, which means subtracting it, Right? Or adding it. So if you take an integral of a function that's like a sine wave, right? Um, the positive regions will be added, the negative regions will be subtracted. And that's kind of the same case. That's like the integral. Uh, the, so the integral controller is, is always going to attempt to do something until the total um, error, the sum error is equal to zero. So if you have a positive value, it's going to make the system um, go in the other direction to try to minimize that value until it tries to reach, reach zero. Um, if you're doing something like, so this is probably more of, of abstract. Some people, what they like to do is they actually like to limit the summed error so that it caps at a particular value so that your the contribution of your eye controller doesn't exceed a particular limit. That is a thing. Um, but in that case, you should probably just be setting a lower eye. Um, yeah. Yes, and then we talked about, yeah, okay. So yeah, the integral controller usually lets us compensate for constant disturbances that cause us to have steady state error. So think about a constant wind going a particular direction, uh, kind of shifting the airplane as it's flying a constant direction all the time. Uh, the derivative controller lets us compensate for something like wind gusts, right? So unpredictable um, gusts of wind that have very high velocity, random direction. Um, and the proportional controller actually lets us go to our desired trajectory, basically. Um, although an eye controller can also technically do that for us. Um, having a, a purely eye controller um, usually is more difficult than having just a PI controller, um, just because of tuning it for so that it doesn't go unstable, but it really depends on the system that you're using. 
Um, the usually servos, like the uh, yeah, servos are usually have a PI controller implemented within them, so that they're actually just a motor with a small PI controller attached, so that lets you give it a signal and then it just goes to an angle, right? With zero steady state error. So it keeps on going until it hits that angle exactly, basically. So this was a very brief overview of one of the most simplest control strategies. There's like, um, I think, three major control courses that you can take at least um, that talk about a lot of this stuff, um, or maybe more. Um, just because the system is simple doesn't mean it's actually bad. Um, there are more complicated control theory concepts that you can learn in school, like analyzing stability, doing simulations, uh, using math labs, and so forth. Um, if you guys are in mechatronics or ECE, you guys might learn this stuff eventually um, in school. Um, but even though they're simple, they're actually pretty robust and they're widely used in or mechanical. You get to learn this effect too. Don't okay. um, yeah, even though they're simple, they're robust and they're pretty widely used in controlling aircraft. That's because aircraft are very nonlinear systems, and um, PID controllers are robust enough to be able to handle that nonlinearity. And nonlinearity is another control term. Um, nonlinearity, for your sake, just means it's really difficult to control uh, on its own or analyze uh, systematically in the way that you would do in uh, control uh, theory. Courses. Cool. Um, so now I'm going to talk about controlling actual aircraft. So we've talked about controlling RC cars. This is how do we apply what we just learned to control an actual aircraft? So what makes an aircraft different from an RC car? So to start, I'm just going to do a very brief um, overview of what SISO and MIMO mean. This is also control terms. So the system we dealt with last time, we had a single steering um, input and a, a single steering output. Um, so we had the sensor that gave us the heading and the servo that controlled the heading, essentially, right? So this is called a SISO system or a single input, single output system. An aircraft, however, might have multiple sensor inputs and multiple motor outputs, right? So in a quadcopter, you have four motors. In a plane, you have the ailerons, elevators, rudders, and the actual motor that gives you the throttle. Um, so this would technically be considered a MIMO system, a multiple input and multiple output system. So MIMO systems are pretty difficult to actually analyze on their own. And when doing uh, aerial vehicle control, not aircraft control, aircraft control is like a whole different territory, I'm sure, but just hobby level, um, aerial vehicle control, we assume that the outputs and the inputs are totally decoupled uh, so that we can simplify them into separate single input, single output systems, right? Uh, because MIMO control is covered in a fourth year course and you can take like graduate level courses on it if you really want. It's, it's a very pretty involved, but not necessary for what we do. And I think even the open source autopilots uh, just consider, it, uh, consider them to be just uh, SISO systems. So in reality though, why I mentioned this in the first place, is because the systems that we work on may actually be coupled. So for example, if you yaw a plane, you will physically induce a roll in the plane as well, right? So one output is actually coupled to another. You can't necessarily, you would think that the ailerons control the roll, the elevator controls the pitch, the rudder controls the yaw, and that's it, you're just happy. But in reality, if you move the rudder, you might actually get an induced roll that you weren't aware of, right? So that's called coupling, when two types of outputs or two types of outputs interact with each other, essentially. Um, I think quads should be more decoupled than planes just because you have totally separate outputs. You just have to superimpose the inputs that you give them to do various maneuvers. Uh, but in planes, that's not necessarily the case. However, assuming SISO is a decent enough assumption to make, and we can let our robust PID controller handle the um, composite for the slight coupling that actually exists in the system. So what that means is, sure, we might yaw a little bit and we might get an induced roll, but we're going to hope that our controller compensates for the roll that we didn't want uh, 
uh, for us without a, a savvy to worry about it. And we're just going to hope that it's not going to destabilize the system, which it should. So let's break down what we have in the plane. So we've got a GPS, and what does that provide us? That provides us the uh, positional information about where the plane is on the globe, and that provides us the alt altitude. We've also got an altimeter that also provides us the altitude. We've got the IMU, which is the inertial measurement unit. Um, it's a, a combination of a gyroscope and an accelerometer and sometimes a compass. Um, and that gives us uh, roll, pitch, and yaw, um, assuming a nice IMU. Um, we also have an airspeed sensor, and that gives us the airspeed. Okay, so say we have these four inputs. We can have more if uh, we need to be, but for this example, we're just going to have four. We've got even more inputs. So say we have an RC controller. Um, the RC controller is like the sticks, right? So it gives us the roll, pitch, and yaw that we want to get to, and it also gives us the desired throttle. And say we connect our plane to a ground station. The ground station provides us with desired waypoints and a desired altitude. So where we want to be positionally in the globe, and how high we want to get to those waypoints. How high we want to be at those waypoints. If we use the RC controller, let's simplify this, and let's just assume that if the RC controller is used, then this doesn't matter. We're just totally going to override the inputs from the RC controller. However, um, mission planner can all, or the ground station can also control the plane by itself because it's an autonomous system. For the plane outputs, as I mentioned previously, we've got the throttle, we've got the ailerons, we've got the elevators, and the rudder. Each control the roll, roll, pitch, yaw, and then actual speed of the motors. So here's the question. I just gave you a bunch of inputs. I gave you a bunch of outputs. How do we control all of these given, how do we control those given all of these inputs and like four outputs, right? I just gave you guys like eight inputs or something. We have four inputs, five, six, seven, eight, eight inputs, four outputs. So how do we control this? Like there's a lot of data here. Right? We've got a lot of inputs in our system. Technically, this is like a MIMO system, but can we simplify this down into a SISO system? Single input, single output system. So the problem, problem one, we have two sensors giving us altitude. That's the first issue, right? The GPS and the altimeter. What do we do since we only need, we, want, we can only have one input for the altitude if we were to uh, maintain the SISO concept, the single input, single output uh, concept in our control design. So the first strategy is to just choose the more accurate sensor. Obviously, an altimeter is going to be far more accurate than a GPS. Um, and just ignore the GPS. We don't really need it. We're only using it for positional information. The second strategy is to actually combine both of the readings and try to get an even more accurate reading that way. So a GPS is very good at giving you um, a GPS. So an altitude, an altimeter is good. But it, it, there's a lot of um, noise uh, around a particular altitude level. Uh, the GPS is good as well, but it's not. It doesn't have as much accuracy, but it's very kind of it has a stable <coughs> altitude signal. Um, so you can kind of combine them. You can kind of, in some way, combine the reliability of the altitude that, altitude that the GPS provides and um, Mix that with the kind of variable um, altitude that the altimeter provides and combine that together. And this is called sensor fusion. Um, this is an actively researched topic and it can also be applied to aerial, aerial robotics. We don't necessarily do any of that in house, uh, but that's a pretty cool thing just to know about in general. So we've solved that problem. We'll just get rid of, for now, we'll just get rid, of, get rid of the GPS. We'll just use the altimeter. Here's the second problem the mission planner or a ground station gives us uh, an altitude and the waypoints. How do we make our plane go to a specific altitude or a specific global location, right? Um, based on the control stuff that we taught previously, it's actually far more low level than that. We can, basically our control stuff is like, I can give it a roll and I can make it go to a desired roll, but this is pretty high level. Like I've got some kind of altitude here um, and some kind of like waypoint that I want to get to. Um, can I, how, can, how do I translate that into motor outputs, right? So we can break down our control system into two levels. We can have a high level control system and a low level control system. 
So the high level control system is in charge of taking the altitude and wave, uh, so taking the altitude and outputting a pitch and throttle ladder. So say we want to get to 100 meters in height, we have the altimeter um, sensor, and we have some kind of thing that converts, we have a separate control system, it could be a PID controller, that converts our input, which is the altitude, to, into an output. And the output in this case is not necessarily a motor output, it could just be a specific pitch and throttle, right? So I want to go to 100 meters, I'm currently at 50 meters, I raise my elevators uh, based on the error, proportional error, so like 25 degrees, um, and I set my throttle to be uh, slightly higher, um, so like 75% so that I can actually climb. Right. Uh, I can also do the exact same thing. So given a set of waypoints. Yeah, sorry, does the climbing thing and like climbing the setting work the same way as the RC car turning left to right, where if it overshoots a little bit, it's going to have that oscillation? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it'll be exactly the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, You'll, you might have like a plane go like that, or just an altitude. It's a, it's, in essence, it's the same thing. Um, throttle is a little bit tricky because you probably don't want to throttle. Um, uh, you don't want to give. You, you might have like uh, some restrictions in place because you don't want to give it a more throttle when you're diving. That's just dangerous. But you can if you want to. It really depends on how you design it with that high level controller. Uh, but yeah, in, in essence, it's the same thing. You'll get the exact same. So if you have a PID controller just for altitude, you'll get the exact same behaviors as we talked about in our C car case. It'll, it might oscillate once you reach an altitude. It might have a constant steady state error where it's like always 10 meters above where you actually want it to fly. Um, it can also destabilize and crash the plane. So that's all of these things that we talked about. All of these things exist um, in, the, in this scenario as well. And this is just for altitude. We can also have the same thing. We can have so we have a set of waypoints, um, and we know where we currently are. So we know we were on, where we want to go. So we can maybe have a different PID controller that converts uh, our current heading, just like like we had in the car, in the car to the next heading that we want to go to. Okay. Um, and we want to have some kind of PID controller so that we navigate the waypoints nicely and smoothly, so that we track beautifully, um, try not to have steady state error, and so forth. Um, and we can kind of classify this all of this high level control stuff and we can call it our path manager, right? Because the input to this path manager is an altitude and a series of waypoints. And what it generates for us is a set of uh, pitch angles that we need to go to and the throttle that we need to get to, um, as well as the heading that we need, we need to get to. So that's how we solve problem two, right? How do we convert what the mission planner and ground station gives us and how do we make our plane go to a specific location? The answer to that is to have two separate controllers, uh, could be PID controllers, one controlling each aspect uh, um, of the inputs, right? So we break our system down into two separate input out SISO systems. In case we're receiving, so to, uh, in case we're receiving input from the RC controller and that mission planner, we'll simply bypass our high level controls and just go to the low level ones that I'll talk about in a bit, right? So if we're, if we're not actually receiving um, an altitude and radius, because recall that the RC controller gives us a desired roll pitch, yaw, and throttle. We don't actually need our high level control system. We already have everything we need here to control the plane. Right? So this is just a technicality, um, depending on your implementation. But yeah. Um, and this works because the RC controller inputs directly correspond to the plane outputs, right? So the RC controller is going to give me roll, pitch, yaw, and throttle, and then my outputs are the same thing. Right? So I can just directly map those if I'm controlling my plane uh, through an RC controller, for example. OK. So let's talk about low-level low controls. So I've got throttle, roll, roll pitch, yaw, uh, and global position. So that's actually, that should be in the high-level control section, my bad. Um, so we have four PID controllers. Um, so, so we have four inputs and four outputs. So the IMU sensor gives us these three. And then we have an airspeed sensor or something that we can use to calculate how much throttle we would need, for example. Uh, or the path planner can give us a throttle based on the altitude that we want to maintain or something. Right? So we have inputs and we have these outputs. So we can just implement four separate PID controllers. 
one controlling each of these, right? Um, so in total, we'd have, combined, we'd have six PID controllers, two that belong to the high-level control section, and four that belong to the low-level control section. All of these, we assume, are totally decoupled. They have no effect on each other. We literally implement them as separate entities. Right? We have separate control surfaces for each one. Um, uh, so we can control them completely independently. We have separate inputs, separate outputs. We just implement four different distinct PID controllers in between. Um, and as I said, they would be decoupled. Now, this is surprisingly simple considering how complex an actual plane is and how much mathematics you would need just to model it in real life. Um, but it, it works. It works well in practice, and this is what we've used, and I'm pretty sure most commercial auto, I don't know about commercial autopilots, but open source autopilots uh, probably just use this uh, thing. Um, so the difference between, before we go on to tuning, the difference between an airplane and a quad, well, in a quad you just have a kind of a different output scheme. You have four motors, right? Previously we had ailerons, we had elevators, we had rudders, and so forth. Here we have four motors. So what, what we can do is we can actually superimpose um, these things. So we can like have the roll, pitch, and your yaw, and uh, throttle. And each controller can contribute up to 25% of the maximum throttle, or something like that, right? So say we have 100% full, 25% um, throttle. Um, so for a quadcopter to roll, you obviously need to like spin these two, or like two of the side to roll. To yaw, you need to spin um, two diagonal motors uh, faster uh, to go up. You just need to move all of them, uh, or move all of them faster. Um, and the last one is pitch, which would be another combination uh, set of motors that you need to roll faster, right? So we can superimpose the outputs of the motors uh, split that into four, and just have each controller control its like its quarter essentially. If that makes any sense, right? So my roll controller can contribute up to 25% onto any one of the motors. My pitch controller can contribute up to 25% throttle onto any, any of the any of the motors as well. Um, essentially, you, you you can modify this scheme so that it goes above 100%. But then you might get an issue where you lose controllability if um, you're you're going too fast or if you're going too high or something. I just wanted to mention that, just a slight difference between um, planes and quads. However, the actual control mechanism is exactly the same. It's just that instead of superimposing the outputs into like one huge output, you just split it into like four pieces. Um, so you divide everything by four and then you combine it. But essentially, it's the exact same thing for quad quadcopters as well. So let's move on to like how do you actually tune these things, right? Like I, I've, I've been talking about proportional, derivative, integral gains. How do you actually find out what they are? How do you do this? Um, P, yeah, PI and D gains, right? We have six different controllers. Each of these controllers takes, if we want to uh, work with a PID system, takes three numbers that we need to input into our control system. So in total, we need to come up with like 18 magical numbers that allows us to control the aircraft perfectly. How do we do that? So this part can be tricky as well as dangerous, especially if you're flying like an aircraft or like a large aircraft, um, or just like even a quad like that, because props can hurt you. Um, and you, you will have to repeat tuning. Tuning is based on the actual physical system that you have. So if you modify an aspect of the system, so say I have this quadcopter, and I have another bigger quadcopter. I can't use the same values for the PID things that I found out for this quadcopter. They're gonna be different. This is totally mapped to your actual physical system. And any modifications that you make to your physical system might affect the values that you'll, you might be need, uh, needing uh, for the system. You might totally, like, for example, if I add like a battery that's off balance into this quadcopter, but I've tuned it when it was perfectly centered, I might be like, wow, my, my quadcopter was flying perfectly before, but now it's totally rolling um, constantly. It's totally just handling terribly. I wonder why. Um, that's because the things that you've tuned are different, right? Even if I just replace a battery with a different size, that also affects things. Right? So this has to be done on a system by system basis. Um, so specifically what we'll be doing downstairs, 
Uh, tuning quads is a lot easier than planes. Planes need airspeed to fly. Quads don't need airspeed to fly. Right? They don't need air going over their wings in order to move forward. Quads are fine. You can control them uh, without the need for that. So we're going to have speci uh, specifically designed benches that limit a specific action of uh, axis of motion so that you're, you're only going to be tuning a single axis. So that could be either the roll or the pitch, one of the two. Um, you can't really tune yaw with uh, the rig that we have set up. Um, and yeah, if you're tuning, the plane's going to be much harder. So to start off, what I usually like to do is set. You don't want to be trying to manipulate like three variables all at the same time, all at once. So say I have my entire system, I haven't even had it to fly yet. Uh, I haven't tested it to fly. I have 18 numbers that I need to put in. And if even one of the one of the 18 numbers is off, my entire system can destabilize and crash. So to start off, a good rule of thumb is just to eliminate the derivative and uh, integral gains. So you have them implemented in your firmware, but turn them off. If you set them to zero, the controllers aren't going to do anything. Right? Because you're multiplying the error value by zero. So the output that they're, they'll be outputting will be zero. Um, so start off by that. So now you've eliminated the 18 numbers you need to find out into six. So that's a little more manageable. And uh, you, can, you actually have a chance of finding out what, what, they, what, what they are. So we'll, we'll start off by only tuning the proportional gain. So increase the proportional gain until your system is oscillatory but stable. This, is, this really depends on what you're trying to achieve. This, when I was writing this, I was talking about um, uh, roll control, right? So if I'm rolling a plane, I, want a, like, I don't want the plane to turn sluggishly. I want it to turn pretty fast, right? Um, if you're doing something less serious, like just an altitude uh, controller, like a control converts altitude into a pitch and throttle, you could probably go less on the uh, proportional gains. You, you don't have to wait until the system oscillates because that becomes dangerous. We can probably afford to climb slower, and that's probably fine. Right? But if you're doing something like roll, or really depending on what you want the behavior of the system to be like, um, if you want like if you want a fast the fastest system that you can design, a fast response time, increase the proportional gain gain until it's oscillatory but stable. Stable meaning it doesn't like go all over the place, right? So to elaborate on that, it's so basically what, what will end up happening is you end up throttling up, and what the quad the quad copter will shake when it's just being peaking. It still has all those oscillations that you're not canceling out, but it's not going to build, and that's the key difference. Is you can have some instability, but as long as those air those instabilities don't build, it'll still fly, but fly with gravity. Um, if these build, then you're basically destined to crash. But if you have your peak gain high enough where it just does this, that means that you're pretty much as good as you can get in terms of, in terms of responsiveness, and now you want to change your other gains to kind of get rid of those oscillations, but still keep that quick response time. You guys will see this in real life uh, when we come downstairs. But essentially, once you kind of have that we call this critically stable when it doesn't oscillate. Um, that's going to be a critical peak. That's going to be the critical gain. Don't go above that because if you go above that, you'll probably go unstable. Um, so then, how you would start is increase your D gain in very, very small increments. Um, usually, it's pretty difficult to find out what a small increment is. It really depends on the actual firmware that you're using, the actual autopilot. Um, for all you know, one could be extremely tiny. Uh, or 0 0.0001 could be extremely tiny, right? And one could be huge. It really depends on the implementation of the autopilot, including how fast the control loop in the autopilot um, uh, spins, as well as how fast your sensor readings are and so forth. Um, but just be safe, go in small increments, and try to go up to a D where the oscillations kind of that you saw from last time die down quicker. Uh, but the system still remains stable. Um, and the ultimate test that I always like to do, especially when it comes to a quad on a test rig, is just kick the quad or like give it a stick uh, and like kind of do an instant disturbance, right? Because that's what our D controller should do. It should react to instant disturbances fairly well and see how the system responds. And make sure it doesn't destabilize, right? Because you don't want your quad flying out of the sky 
because of a, like a small gust of wind. Um, so that's probably a good test. If you manage to give it an instant disturbance and the system is still decent, decently stabilizes, um, then it's okay. If it destabilizes, your D-gain is probably high, lower it, or try lowering your proportional. Finally, finally, at the very, very end, add your integral term. Never add an integral term too early because that just tends to screw things, a lot of things up. Uh, it's like the easiest way to totally destabilize the system from my experience. Um, the D controller is also, or the D gain is also a good way, but they, I don't know, for some reason you always need to have a very low value um, of why to get decent performance. Um, but yeah, so try to add, so say you're in the quad, you might notice um, in the test rig that the quad kind of stabilizes maybe like a slight, slight offset, like 15 degree offset, um, even if you have a PD controller in place. So, after adding an eye controller, you should see the, actual, the system actually stabilize um, to have zero state of error as we mentioned. That's what you want to see. Um, and you want to kind of do it in a relative, so that it stabilizes in a relatively rapid manner. Because like a few seconds of the uh, quad stabilizing like this means that it's like, you know, 30 meters away from where you might want it to be. So you, you do want rapid performance when you have an eye gain, especially for something like um, and yes, something that I really like, you know, poking the quads with a stick, and you can also do a good uh, poke test by basically uh, poking the quadcopter with a constant force, and then as time goes on, you should see the, the uh, quadcopter resisting uh, you more and more and more, up to one, right? And that's how you know your eye controller is working well. Um, and once you have all your three, three of the, the gain set, I like to kick it again, you know, the kick test basically uh, rapidly disturb the system and see how it recovers from the instability. So in general, this is very, um, yeah, last notes. So this is very, there's no, like this is kind of a systematic way of doing it, but it's definitely not the only correct way. And again, as I mentioned, when I wrote these slides, I was mainly referring to like roll control. If you have something less sensitive like altitude or heading, you can go slower. You don't have to go you don't have to build a very aggressive control system for that. But when you, in, um, in places where you want tight control, like roll, pitch, um, or maybe other things, you might want to do uh, perform these steps and get tighter control. Um, depending, and also just remember, you don't, act, you don't always need a PID controller. If, a P, if just setting the P gain gives you the performance that you want, or the performance that um, so you desire, then leave it at that. You don't need to go above and try to set an IID. Um, usually, PID, a full PID controller um, is necessary for actually like, the roll pitch at the very least. Um, but other aspects of it you can test out for yourself. So final notes on tuning. This was like very, 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 very loosely based on the zeigler nicholas method. Um, their method is so controls is a very broad field. It was actually, it was never, initially people used controls in like plumbing and water systems and mechanical systems. That's how they implemented the same concepts, just into different systems. We're obviously working with software systems. So this uh, method is like a tuning method that is kind of similar. They have actually a specific, uh, specific table of numbers um, that you could maybe use um, to tune the quad. Uh, basically, it revolves around finding the critical P, as we mentioned, and like getting using the 70% or using half of the value of the actual critical P, and then there's some calculations that they've done uh, to give you appropriate D and I terms. This can be a good method just to get initial values um, for uh, your gains, um, and it's available in the slides if you guys want to take a look. But I think this is primarily used for like mechanical and hydraulic systems. So it's not directly related to what we do. We, um, but it, it is a good starting point, I think. Cool. Are you guys doing this? Uh, yeah, we're going to be doing this after this. Um, um, okay. I think, uh, what else do you have? Just like it's interesting. Yeah. This is just like, oh, this is the last slide. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so we've set up three kind of test quads. So um, effectively, we're going to be doing 
what Serge was just talking about, about um, tuning your roll response on the jig. So uh, the three quads all look kind of similar to this. Um, they have this big attachment on the top, and what this effectively does is lets us stick a skewer right through the middle of the quad, and it prevents it from moving up and down, and really only allows it to pivot this way. So that makes it a lot safer to tune, and you're not going to be worrying about other things kind of affecting your, your stability. So it's going to be a lot of a pretty straightforward way to, to tune it. It's the way that we've tuned anything something from something like kind of smallish like this to like, you know, a big almost one meter diagonal span uh, quadcopter. Just depending on how big of a jig you build, that's how well you can tune it. Um, I can even just plug it in right now and show you roughly what the PID response would look like without motors. So, I'm just going to turn this guy on. Welcome to Open TEX. Switch warning. So, okay, so right now I have everything listed at basically media, uh, at like the base level of throttle. So, this is like the idle speed. Of the quad. Oh, it didn't like that. Um, why it timed out right now, I think, is it sees a response and it's expecting a response, but it's not getting anything. So it kind of times out. There's a safety feature inside the autopilot that that will do that. When you have props on and it'll stabilize itself, it kind of you avoid having that problem. Um, it, it'll automatically disarm. So if you can see, if I spin up more in this side, if I spin up here, these two motors will spin up. But I was keeping it in here for a long enough time, and it's going to keep building and building these eye turns. And you kind of you would see it more if you're up closer. You can really see the speed of the motors more. But it'll spin up these more and more and more and more, and it'll expect it to do this. But again, there's a safety controller in here as well that says, "Hey, I've been doing this for so long. I've been getting no change. Something's wrong. I'm going to disarm." Right? That's a safety feature that's in here. Uh, but again, with props, it should be okay. Um, so let's all go downstairs. We have we should have three uh, benches set up for that, um, and we'll be able to actually test it out properly.